The Holy Gospel today is from John chapter 4. Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For we have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to her, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am He, the one who is speaking to you. Just when then his disciples came, they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, What do you want? Or, Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him anything, to, something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around, and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have done, ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Sing our sermon.
Dear ears of the Word of God, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When you were growing up as a kid, who were the people you were told to avoid? What part of the city or country would you be warm about? And what would have happened to you if you had gone there? When I, when I was a kid in uh, Elbert Lee, Minnesota, uh, there was a section of town that was across the tracks. That's, that's, what, that's what we said. They were across the tracks. And uh, my friend said, oh, they live over on the other side of the tracks. Don't go over there. They're the ones that work at Wilson's. It was a packing plant. They live on the other side of the tracks. Avoid that. So my twin brother and I, what did we do? <laughs> we went over to the tracks. And we had made friends with Freddie, Freddie Garza. His parents were, uh, were Mexican. And uh, we never saw a Mexican kid before. So, it was great. We didn't get the out of the tracks thing. But as I grew up, I knew what that meant. Learned about it. But we all know what that's about, right? We all know what part of the city or country you were warned about, or who, what, the, what kind of people you were told to avoid. When Jesus' disciples come, John, John says, they were astonished that he was speaking to a woman. <laughs> but they didn't want to say anything. Jesus' longest recorded conversation with anyone in the Bible is in our gospel this morning. Some of you are probably wondering that too as you're standing going, how long is this going to go on, right? <laughs> this is a long reading. For many reasons, uh, this conversation should not have happened, okay? It should not have happened. There are rules to prevent this very conversation from happening, if you are a Samaritan and if you're a Jewish. And we had a woman who was a Samaritan, and we have Jesus who was a Jew. So how come they didn't get it? Why weren't they following the rules? The number one rule is, men and women don't talk to each other in public. Husbands don't talk to their wives in public in Jesus' day. They don't talk to their daughters in public because men and women don't do that. Uh, they didn't sit each, with each other in worship. So if we were in Jesus' day right now, we'd have to say, okay, find your spot, right? Sit on the right side. Now that, that wasn't too much farther in, the, in our own past where that was true. In, in some churches, it was it, up until the, the, early, the early 20th century. Men sat on one side, women sat on the other. Some Pharisees were called the bloodied and bruised Pharisees. They believed they shouldn't even look at a woman when they walked, and so they closed their eyes. So why were they called the bloody and bruised Pharisees? They kept running into things. I mean, how ridiculous is that? But they, there was a group that were that that uh, worried that they were called they're called the bloody ones or the blue bruised ones, and they kept running into things. No, that might be a, a urban legend. <laughs> Actually, urban that wouldn't be an urban, would it? But anyway, uh, so you have that divide right away, and the disciples and the John, the gospel writer, even notices it, writes it in the gospel. You know, they're astonished you speaking to a woman. Uh, the other thing is you have a citizen of one country and a traveling, a traveler coming through town. And those types of people, uh, you didn't really associate with traveling salesmen. You know, have you ever seen the movie The Music Man? You know, Professor, well, watch out. Who is this guy? Well, where is he from? Well, I don't know. He's a spellbinder. Who is this Jesus? Who is that stranger? He's not one of us. He doesn't 
wear clothes like we do. The Jews and Samaritans wear distinctive clothing. That's, that's how you can tell them. You can tell them a mile away. You know, if you have that good advice. But you can tell by the way they wore. And, uh, and so you have that divide. You know, you just kind of stay to yourself. And finally, you had uh, the Jew, Jesus, and the Samaritan woman. Another divide. Another group, another thing that had caused uh, division and, and separateness. So what is going on here? Uh, why uh, is this story in there? Well, throughout the Gospel of John, uh, John uh, says things in advance to the reader to let people know what's going on before it happens. Uh, before the feeding of the 5,000, this is a picture from Hachi. Here's another painting of the same, uh, the same story, the woman at the well. Before feeding the 5,000, uh, John has this to say in the Gospel of John. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, one of the disciples, where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Okay? Uh, before Jesus healed a man who was blind from birth, uh, John, the writer, has this to say. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents said, he was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. So what is going on here? Why is Jesus here? Well, the clue is in the beginning of the gospel assigned today. Jesus left Judea, started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. He had to go there. This is a need that is unrelated to geography. It's unrelated to time. It's God's plan. And this is what John had to say uh, last week. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Why did He have to go to Samaria? The Jews and Samaritans don't talk. They don't associate. Well, why? I suppose you'd have to go back to the Civil War. You know, the war between the North and the South. The South won. I'm talking about the war between Israel and Judah. The Civil War. After Solomon, David's son, built the temple. Solomon the wise, right? Smart guy. Knew how to control things. Uh, he was smart, but foolish. Uh, but he built a lot of buildings and he held the country together. But when he died, his son couldn't do it. Uh, his son... Uh, his son said, well, if you thought my dad was tough, I got more strength in my little bitty pinky finger than his whole arm. The older advisor says, take it easy on the people. Your dad was, he was, he was smart, he was wise, but he really, he really taxed us. Both um, physically and, and, and financially, and just, you know, we, we, we did it, but just ease up. But the younger, uh, the younger king's friends said, the young friends of him said, no, 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 let him, you you got to show him who's boss. you got to cut your own spurs. Let him know you're in charge. Don't let up. And he didn't, and the country split. North South. So you had the northern kingdom, the green, and the southern kingdom, the purple. Israel's the north, Judah's the south. In 721, the Assyrians, Assyrian country, captured 
uh, it was northern Israel. Most of the people scattered to the four winds. Uh, those that couldn't afford to leave uh, stayed. They had nowhere else to go. And the soldiers claimed them as their as their wives, the, the, the descendants. They, they married them, had children. Here's a, a picture of an Assyrian soldier facing an Israelite soldier. Assyrians were very technologically advanced over Israel. They had metal helmets, breastplates, bows and arrows. They were superior militarily to Israel. And so they won. Those who, uh, again, those who had any substance, they, the, the Syrians deported them, said, you can't live here, and they just leave. Uh, can't stay here. And the surviving Israelites were, were married by the soldiers and the rulers. Well, several years later, the southern kingdom, Judah, was... Uh, captured by Babylon, they were brought into exile in 587 B.C. But then, King Cyrus of Persia let them come back. He, he defeated the Babylonians and let the people who were in exile, who were captured, try to take away, come back. He said, you can go back to Jerusalem, go back to your country and build the temple. They said, well, who's going to help us build the temple? And some of the Samaritan, some of the people lived in the north said, well, we'll help you do it. Said, you're not going to help us do anything. You're from Israel. You're half-breeds. Your fathers were Assyrian soldiers, your grandfathers. We don't want anything to do with you. You are impure. You cannot help us at all. We're not going to, you're not allowed to do it. So right away you had this division. Well, the Samaritan said, fine. We'll make our own temple. You have yours in Jerusalem, we have ours in Mount Gerizim. And then you had that split. So you had an ethnic split, uh, a, a, a racial split, a religious split. They had disdain for the Samaritans, Jews. And Samaritans had disdain for the Jews as well. So when the woman says to Jesus, why is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? Don't you know the rules? Where have you been? Were you born in a bar? She didn't say that. She could have, and it would have been true. So, what did Jesus do? There, there's this, uh, John said he had to go to Samaria. Normally, this is how they traveled from Jerusalem to Galilee. They would start down here in Jericho or Jerusalem, walk across the sea of the Jordan River, and walk on this side of the river to avoid Samaria. No, no Jew would go through Samaria. But Jesus had to. Had to. Because it's God's idea, it's his mission to do this. God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Through him. He broke a centuries old taboo. He went there to Samaria. He sat on the well and he talks with a woman, uh, a Samaritan woman, of course. He asked for a drink, and the only vessel, the only thing available to drink from, is something that she touched. Can you imagine that? Touching, drinking water from a woman from Samaria? just boggles the mind. That's what the disciples were seeing and thinking. They, if, uh, if they saw him drink water from the jar that she was carrying, they probably would have had a heart attack. So thankfully they came later and just saw that he was speaking to her. As, asking her for a drink. They have a conversation about the well and the water. And he offers her more than water that she has to keep coming and drawing from day after day after day. It's noon. Gotta get water every day. Are you greater than Jacob? We know the answer to that, don't we? Yes. Yes, he is. 
In fact, uh, he knows a lot about everything. He knows a lot about her. He knows everything about her. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. There's another painting of Hachi. Different, different view. His knowledge of this woman convinces her that he is a prophet. That reminds me, the woman says, uh, we worship on Mount Gerizim. You say we got to worship in Jerusalem. Who's right? Getting in the debate. To her surprise, he does not debate her. He talks about what God is interested in, true worship. Not, not defined by geography, not defined by place, but is it true? Is it spiritual? <coughs> God in Jesus Christ is transcending all of these boundaries. Boundaries between men and women, between Samaritan and Jew, between tradition, place, and even liturgy and worship style. This traveler, this stranger, this Jewish man is greater than Jacob. He is a prophet, but more than a prophet. For the woman, it's the only, the only thing left. The lights come on. He can't be the Messiah, can he? He's got to be the Messiah. She leaves. She runs after hearing Jesus says, I know the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he's going to tell us everything. I am, Jesus says. Now the Greek says, just says that, I am. English, it says, I am he who is speaking to you. But he, could, he just probably said, I am. So God says to Moses in the burning bush, isn't it? I am. He's God. Whatever the reason, she runs, leaves her jar, and goes in the city. What does she say? Come see a man that knows everything about me. He told me everything that I've ever done. This can't be the Messiah, can he? She's a witness. Uh, but, not, but, a not, but, a, but not a very likely witness, and not, not even a thorough witness. Uh, to say a man, come see a man who told me everything I ever did, is not exactly a, uh, a, a recitation of the Apostles' Creed, but it piques the interest of the people. Why? How can anybody know about you? A stranger from Jerusalem? How, how does he know about you? Well, let's go find out. So, her witness is enough. It's her own. See? She doesn't have to copy somebody else's witness. It's her own. You don't have to tell somebody else's story. Tell your own. What has Jesus done in your life? You don't have to say, gee, I wish I had a story like his. This is much more exciting. Tell your own. It's the only one you got. Her witness is enough. It is an invitation and see for yourself. They come back and see for themselves. They hear her testimony, the townspeople, and Jesus sticks around. Jesus tells them who he is. This conversation with this woman the longest one ever recorded of Jesus in the Bible, of any one person. Uh, he offers her what she needs. He meets her where she is. Right where she's at. But he never leaves her there. It's changed. So Jesus does the whole thing. Everywhere. In the New Testament. He always meets people where they're at. He doesn't say, well, why don't you clean up your act and then I'll talk to you next week after, you know, you, you do all these other things. No, he talks to him right there, right at the well. And the disciples are speechless. Why are you talking to her? Can we leave now? We got the food, let's go. Look, come on, Jesus, we got to get going. No, oh, he's going to talk. Let's stay. And he offers himself, as he offers everyone, the living water. The true bread from heaven. 
In doing so, he draws uh, her out of herself. She runs back, tells everyone, who cares? He knows everything about me. Town people probably knows everything about her too. So what? Doesn't matter. Come see this man. Jesus came to buy back those who are in slavery, to restore and to heal those who have been broken, to make whole those who have been shattered. Uh, he did it then with this woman, with the townspeople that came out two days later, in the next couple days, wherever he goes. Uh, and he does it now. Uh, may we, like the woman at the well, say with boldness, as she did, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand. Let us confess together now our Christian faith using the words of the...